and without further ado, I would like to hand you over to David Tolbert um, from Catch UK. Thank you, David. Thanks very much, and, and thanks everyone for uh, for having me here. And and um, it's great to see uh, see the interest in this topic. It's it's actually a subject that uh, I am absolutely passionate about. I've lived and breathed it for the last two years, I think now. Um, and it's something that I think is going to be a game changer for our region. And so it's great to see um, the engagement um, as part of this Green Careers Week. Um, what I'd like to do, um, probably over, say, the next 40 minutes or so, um, is I'm going to start by talking about my organisation, because I'm sure that across the region, um, not everyone will have heard of, uh, of Catch UK, um, who we are, what we're, what we're all about. I'll, I'll kind of briefly touch on that, but not go into too much detail, but really to explain why we're involved in the industrial decarbonisation space. And that's what this is all about, industrial decarbonisation. Um, and I need to put a kind of, a, a, I suppose, a, a bit of a health warning on, on this first. Um, this, this is a really exciting aspirational um, opportunity for our region. Um, as, as was mentioned earlier, you know, that, that opportunity to get to net zero industrial emissions. We are the biggest emitting cluster, uh, industrial cluster across the UK. If we can get our region to net zero, then we have got an opportunity that we can take not just onto the national stage, but onto the world stage. Uh, but more of that as we go on. So why, why is so? What I'd like to start with is why is my organisation involved in that space? Um, then outline what the Humber Industrial Cluster Plan actually is, what it's all about, um, what what it will deliver for this region. And and interesting, what when I say this region, obviously we're talking um, Greater Lincolnshire here. Um, but the the Humber Industrial Cluster Plan is north and south bank of the Humber. It's that industrial belt. Um, that leads from kind of from Grimsby right round to to the Easington kind of gas terminal uh, right round the Humber region. Um, so I'll talk about the plan. I'll talk about what its outputs will be and what what's gone into it. But then probably more critical to this audience is is around that kind of skills piece that's dropping out of it. And there's a huge uh, amount of work that's gone into into various studies as part of the plan. And one of the plans, um, you know, one of the studies has been um, a, a, a deep dive by KPMG into the skills needs for our region. And I, I you know, it, this really is my soapbox subject. Uh, and I would, I, I would love to enthuse this audience the same way that we here at Catch are enthused about the opportunities in industrial decarbonisation on a skills and training perspective. So that's really where I want to be. And then I want to talk a little bit about the Humber Vision as well, just to round things off. Um, the Humber Vision um, was launched uh, in Westminster last week, um, and it's a really exciting opportunity to, to turn this region into something quite spe special from an aspirational perspective, and, and, and we all need to get behind it. So to start all of that off, what is CATCH and uh, why are we involved in industrial decarbonisation? Um, so CATCH is an industrial uh, skills, uh, membership and supply chain um, service, uh, services company. We have 50 core member companies um, through Greater Lincolnshire, uh, the Humber and into West Yorkshire, actually into West Yorkshire as far as Huddersfield. Um, we have, as I say, 50 core member companies, 240 supply chain companies, um, and um, we offer um, events, networking events, conferences, etc. In terms of our, our, um, our, our membership um, offer, um, but we also have a site here in Stalingbridge, just outside uh, Grimsby, where we offer adult skills in terms of regulatory health and safety, um, upskilling, uh, reskilling for for, um, for our industrial members and wider stakeholders. But we also have an apprenticeship provision. We have 130 apprentices on our books, uh, and that number is going to um, grow exponentially for reasons that I will explain. Um, and we have some fantastic opportunities that we offer through our apprenticeship provision. So we have chemical process operators, um, we have mechanical technicians, and we have electrical technicians. Um, and all of those individuals are studying at level, primarily level three, some level two, um, and they will be going on to very highly skilled jobs 
um, within um, within the industry around the Humber Bank, but but interestingly within that um, decarbonisation space primarily. Um, I like this picture that we've got here uh, on the right hand side of this slide. The picture shows our um, our site, um, the building in in the the, uh, the the kind of the bottom of the the picture is actually a fully functioning process manufacturing plant, a chemical manufacturing plant, and it's on our site. And we can receive a chemical product, we can, we can uh, mix it, we can heat it, we can um, filter it, we can produce a product at the end of the day and issue it out to a road tanker or a ship. But at the end of the day, all we're doing is moving water around, so it's a safe, benign environment for our young apprentices to learn their trade. And they'll traditionally come here for about a year um, because, of course, if you're going on to a chemical plant or a refinery or, or a steel works, um, you know, it's, it's an inherently dangerous environment. So you don't want a young 16 year old learning their trade on your site. So what happens is they will come here for a year um, before they even really go onto their employer's site um, to learn the behaviours, not just the trade, but the behaviours. And, and some of the people that come out from our apprenticeships will be on you know, very good um, salaries, you know, upwards of 36 to 38,000 pound a year um, in, in, as I say, highly, highly skilled, um, sustainable jobs. And uh, it's, it's, it's a really exciting opportunity for them. Um, just some facts and figures uh, about us. Um, you know, we, we're on quite a journey ourselves. We have three locations based here in Stalingrad. We have a site over um, uh, just over the bridge in Hull, and uh, we're also operating. We have um, about 20 apprentices over in Bradford as well uh, for process operators. Um, but yeah, we have quite a footfall across our site in terms of adult uh, delegates and, and apprentices. Um, and we've grown exponentially year on year, which shows that there is a need for the industry led provision that we offer. So just to round off, really, the industry led provision, this side slide um, really does show that this is my board. So I report to 20 um, leaders from our region. These are all senior leadership members from these organizations uh, that, that comprise the board of catch. And you can see that some of the big client companies, the Ineos is, um, um, the, the, the Philips 66, um, you know, some of, the, some of the big client companies, the Lime Quarry, Singleton Birch over, over by the airport, um, ABP. You can see there are also some of the big contracting companies, the Worleys uh, and the Jacobs. So these are the kind of companies that, that you know, should be exciting our young people you know, for opportunities that they, they could be working for these organisations. So they've got the good industrial understanding of the landscape around the Humber. And they're all energy intensive, energy producing uh, companies. You can also see that we've got some of the, we've got three of the four local authorities who sit on our board around the Humber. So in terms of this audience, we've got North East Lincolnshire and North Lincolnshire at senior SLT level. Uh, and we also have um, two uh, academia from the University of Lincoln and uh, the University of Hull at uh, kind of pro vice chancellor type level. So that's a really exciting industrial leadership board for the region. And that's a really important point that I want to make. So into the uh, meat of what I'm going to talk about. That's why we're involved, because our members are energy intensive industries, energy producing industries and the kind of support mechanism around them. So it was really important for us if we're going to support our members properly. It was really important that we got into this industrial decarbonisation space. And I'm, I need to make the point that I'm not talking here about um, PV fitters, I'm not talking about EV charging points, I'm talking about how do we get rid of the industrial emissions from the manufacturing processes around our region. And that is, that's, the, that's the really nub of what we're trying to achieve here. <clears throat> so the Humber Industrial Cl Cluster Plan, what is it? Well, as, as that we mentioned earlier, right at the beginning, it is the, the roadmap to net zero for industrial emissions. Um, we've been working on this for a couple of years now, um, and um, we're, we're into um, a phase, uh, the main phase of delivery. And we are going to submit that roadmap in March of, uh, March of next year. We're working alongside the Hull and East Yorkshire LEP uh, as co-partners in delivering the Humber Industrial Cluster Plan. It's a 2.6 million pound project. It involves a number of key industrial partners, 
who you can see across the top line, who are actually committed resource or financing into this project. And they are, as you can see there, quite clearly some of the big emitters. They, you've got the refineries, you've got the British Steel. There are also some of the solution providers, National Grid Ventures and Equinor, uh, and some of the big uh, energy producers, um, SSE Thermal and, and, and VPI, of course, being the uh, combined heat and power unit for, for the refineries. So you can, see, you can see there that we have some of the big players in terms of getting this region to net zero. And we, we've also taken on a number of other partners as, we go th as, we, as we've gone through the project who've seen the importance of, of the work that we're doing. So the Prax refinery, the Lindsay Oil refinery, um, Harbour Energy, who are delivering a, a key project in Greater Lincolnshire around um, the pipeline down to Theddlethorpe um, for, for um, carbon uh, transportation and storage. Um, Singleton Birch, as I said before, the Lime Quarry, the South Humber Bank Power Station, Uniper, some of the key players. So we've got a really good mix of organisations there to, to work on this plan to deliver um, net zero. So this is the meat of the problem. Um, the Humber is by far the biggest emitting cluster industrial of in, industrial emissions. 20 million tonnes of emissions just from manufacturing industries. There is another 5 million tonnes on top of that if you include the energy production from this region. So 25 million tonnes, by far the biggest cluster. In fact, if you took um, North Lincolnshire, just North Lincolnshire, with two refineries and the steelworks, the emissions from that region are bigger than the next nearest cluster, industrial cluster, which is North Wales, sorry, South Wales. So we've got a problem. And in fact, um, two thirds of those emissions for the region come from the two refineries and, um, and the steelworks. So you can see that we, we, we really do have a problem. So the region, as I said earlier, could be seen as a massive, massive problem and something that needs to be solved. But of course, if you can solve this problem, and this is the, 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 the real crux of what we're trying to achieve here, if you can solve this problem, you've got a massive opportunity to take our region and put it onto the world stage. Because if you can decarbonize the Humber, you can decarbonize anywhere. So we've got a map here that um, shows what we're going to do um, with our emissions. Um, there are carbon storage sites offshore um, that have been identified. So for example, uh, the endurance field is a saline aquifer uh, which is a, um, an unused site that could be used um, quite, from what I understand, quite simply to store carbon. But also there's a site off Thettlethorpe as well um, that's an existing um, site that could be uh, repurposed. Um, so there are lots of opportunities in terms of storage off our region. And you can see from the map around the UK, you know, we are so well placed as a region to become a world leader in terms of carbon storage. So we're the largest emitting cluster. We're really close to some great carbon storage sites uh, around the Southern North Sea. Um, we've got some fantastic plans around hydrogen production for energy transition uh, to low carbon, you know, hydrogen being obviously a low carbon fuel. Um, we've got uh, some fantastic renewable power opportunities in terms of biomass um, through the Jack Drax power station. Uh, which will give us negative emissions. Now, um, some of you may have seen the, uh, um, the, the programme uh, a few weeks back um, that kind of cast doubt on the, um, the Drax um, story. But actually, it's a, when, when you start to delve into it in detail, um, the, the opportunity in terms of negative emissions from, from, from biomass, um, in that you've captured the carbon in the wooden pallets, uh, and then if you can capture the carbon as it's released in producing the energy, you've, you've actually kept the carbon out of the atmosphere completely. Uh, and therefore, you have a negative emission across the region, which helps us in that position of getting to net zero. Because through all the best will in the world, with two refineries, a chemical park on the North Bank, loads of specialty chemicals companies and manufacturers around the, the region, um, it, it, it's re it, 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 it would be nigh on impossible to get to absolute zero. So with negative emissions being offset through, through the opportunity from tracks, there is a, um, th th that's our route effectively to net zero. So we are ideally um, positioned for lots of reasons.
to be a leader in, in this net zero for uh, industrial emissions. So where are we in terms of the plan? Uh, it's three phase plan. Uh, phase one was, was undertaken um, um, a couple of years back and that was to, to understand the landscape. And that's where we get the figures such as the, you know, the 20 million tonnes of industrial emissions. We're now currently in phase two, which is delivering the roadmap. Uh, and as I say, that will be submitted in March of 23, and there will be a, a launch event for that. So please keep keep an eye out for that. And then phase three to me is actually the most important point because, you know, the plan is going to be submitted in March of 23. Well, the uh, industrial strategy uh, challenge fund that this is uh, funded through um, has a need for a low carbon cluster by 2030 and net zero by 2040. So we have to support, as a region, we have to support our industry um, right through to 2040. So we don't just produce a roadmap and then give up. There's got to be some legacy work that comes out of that to support our industry in getting to net zero. So what is the cluster plan? The cluster plan is a number of work packages um, that feed into um, a piece of work being, being undertaken by a consultant to actually um, pull all the, distill all the information that's out there uh, and, and produce the, the roadmap. Um, the work packages include um, engaging stakeholders, and, and this is the kind of activity that we've been doing. It's making sure that people understand what is going on out there uh, in, in terms of the industrial decarbonisation activity. So stakeholder engagement and communication. It's, we've, we've produced a website, and, and please look it up. It, it is at the Humber Industrial Cluster Plan. Uh, is the website. Uh, we undertake a number of network meetings. So as CATCH, we facilitate um, a decarbonisation network group and a hydrogen network group, um, which have over 100 delegates uh, regularly. Um, so, um, and we've also uh, produced a map, uh, which I think Debbie mentioned, mentioned at, at, the, at the beginning there, and, and I'll show you the map in, in a moment. Um, so critically though, in terms of the key technical stuff, um, we have, um, so we've got a number of studies that feed into a model, uh, and the model is a key piece of work here. So we'll then turn the handle on the model, um, and then out will come this roadmap to net zero. Ha is it possible under four different scenarios that we've created, um, which kind of can be tweaked depending on how much carbon capture is, is anticipated, how much hydrogen energy transition can be undertaken? Is there any new technology coming along? So there's a number of technical studies. Um, there's a skill study, and that's the bit I'll focus on in a moment. Um, there's a supply chain study. There's a social um, engagement study. Um, and, and then, as I say, some technology um, capability, uh, technology deep dives that all feed into the, the actual plan itself. And then Arup will be producing the plan on our behalf. And here's a, a nice summary of all of that. Um, so we've got a number of partners uh, alongside the project delivery team, which we're inside alongside um, the, the, the HALEP and, and some industrial partners. Um, and then if we work across from the left on this herringbone, um, phase one fed into uh, the model, that kind of landscape data for the region. So we have a really good understanding of the, the, uh, the landscape um, from the phase one work that we undertake. We then refreshed all of that. Um, we, we fed in a number of studies like technical studies, the societal study, the supply chain study, the inward investment study and, and the skills study. And, and out of that, we then, as I say, we turn the handle on this systems model um, and, and out will pop the roadmap to net zero. And that's what will be uh, submitted on the 20th, uh, sorry, May next, uh, March of next year, with the end goal being net zero for our region by 2040. OK, so this is the. This is the, the real kind of uh, crux of it. Uh, I'm sorry there, there's gonna be a bit of text here, but it's very difficult to kind of, uh, to summarize a kind of a, a hundred page document in, in, um, in, in nice pithy slides. So there is a bit of um, text here and I, I, I do kind of apologize for that, um, but I'll try and pull out um, the, the important aspects. So this is what we're here for really. Um, so the skills review is a high level skills review. Um, on, on, on um, you know, how we're going to develop a net zero cluster for the region. Um, and what's important to point out is this is from Avanicio. This is from a, a, a young um, 
person at, at school, primary, secondary, right through to um, level eight uh, and everything in between. Um, it's really important to highlight that we're looking at not just complexity of skills, you know, the higher the level, we're also looking at the volume of skills needed, and that's really important to me. Um, so we're, we're looking at the capacity, so we're looking at the demand pull, and I'll come up with some facts and figures in a moment. We're looking at that pipeline and the capability to deliver that pipeline. And an interesting comment was made to me um, by one of our colleagues in industry the other day, and, and I was explaining that we've got 130 learners on our books, our apprentices on our books. And he said to me, so how are you going to um, upscale that to a thousand? You know, that's the kind of figures we need to talk about. And that's why I need to engage people. That's why I need people to get behind um, the kind of work that we're doing. We need thousands of young people to come into our industries um, to get into something that's, and this is, this is the interesting thing. And this is where I'd really welcome some conversation maybe afterwards. Um, the I'm talking about the petrochemical sector. I'm talking about the chemical sector. I'm talking about energy production. Um, traditionally, you know, traditional industries, dirty industries, maybe not seen as green industries. And yet we're in a green skills week. So I, I was chatting to some of our learners um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and I was, I said this very same point to them, because of course they the, our learners are employed by the refineries, they're employed by the chemical manufacturers. So um, I was talking to them and, and I was expecting a really deep two-way conversation and I wasn't getting much feedback. So I said to them, is this not something that, you know, you hear about the kind of the demonstrations that go on day in, day out, is it's not something that, that, that is really important to you? And actually it's not. And so I'd really welcome maybe some, some thoughts from the audience as to whether this is something that really interests young people. I actually said, so what's your motivator for coming into our industry? And the answer that came back was money. It's as simple as that. As I said, you can finish a young 18 year old going on to refinery, you can be on 38,000 pound a year. So it's quite aspirational money, but also you're gonna get a good, um, highly skilled job, highly skilled trade. So that, that's an interesting thought to me, but okay, so you've got the demand pull. Have we got the skills pipeline needed to meet that demand pull? And as I say, I've got to scale up caps from 100 apprentices to 1,000. That's the kind of figures we're talking about. What are the kind of blockers for doing that? You know, what's gonna stop us from doing that? And have we got the aspiration in this region to do it? Because we need to. And then we're going to look at some recommendations and, and kind of key issues and, and see how we're going to get there. So that was the kind of the, that's what the, the study was there for. OK, so what were the kind of what do we get out of it? I mentioned it's from ab initio up to level eight. But actually, what we're finding is you know, whenever I talk to anyone from industry, what do we need? Welders, welders, welders. There you go. There's the takeaway from today. If we don't build this infrastructure, we can't operate it. We can't deliver net zero. So the first challenge is to build it. What do we need to build it? We need engineering construction trades. So we need pipe fitters, we need welders. We need mechanical fitters, we need electri electrical fitters, uh, electrical trades. That's what we need. So you can see on this chart here that, um, so let, let's start actually on the left-hand side. So KPMG have undertaken this kind of deep dive into the skills needs to get us to net zero. Um, the first bullet is quite key. So for every billion pounds invested in infrastructure in our region as part of this decarbonisation roadmap, we are going to create 5,000 new direct jobs in industry. That sounds a lot until you actually think that we, are, we, we have 15 billion pounds worth of investment planned across the region. Even I can do those maths. Um, you know, we, are, we need something like 75,000 new jobs. And it's in these areas that I'm, I'm showing on the right hand side to deliver that infrastructure. Now, that's phased. That's not something that we don't need 75 tradespeople now. That's over the next kind of uh, through to 2040. 
all of these projects are going to be phased. They're not all going to happen together. But of course, if we don't grow these young people here, and it's a great opportunity for our people, um, if we don't grow them now here, then they will come from that from across the UK. They will come from overseas. They they yeah. We we have to build this infrastructure. There is that is that is not in doubt. Where the young people come from to or sorry, where the tradespeople come from to deliver this is another matter. So seventy five thousand new jobs over the next thirty years. Uh, sorry, twenty years. At the moment, the um, sorry, I, I am colour blind. I think it's orange. Um, columns there show the trades that we already have working in this region. One thousand five hundred tradespeople working in this region in those trades that are seen as critical. So really, for me, this is the big takeaway um, from from this session. Um, we have, this is where I'm starting to see the skills gap articulated really properly and clearly for the first time. It's not skills as in capability, it's skills as in numbers. And that's a key message from me. And that's inter what's interesting here is that even with the orange figures, we are now starting to see, um, just for business as usual, we are starting to see gaps in terms of competent tradespeople to deliver the current needs, never mind this 15 billion pounds worth of investment. You know, we're hearing from our members that they are struggling now um, for what they call turn, shutdown turnarounds, where they basically shut the, shut the site down to undertake a load of maintenance work that's needed on site. They have to do this, and they are struggling to find competent tradespeople to do that. So even without the, uh, the, the, the kind of bow wave of trades coming um, that needed, we are already struggling. And the other thing, and I'll come on to it um, in a couple of slides, is around um, the client contractor relationship. That's really important with this region. And what we're finding is that the contractors to the big client companies are already struggling to maintain their workforce because they're quite a transient workforce. At the moment, the nuclear projects are, are obviously key and critical, critical national infrastructure. So they are taking a lot of skilled tradespeople away. So very short, long term and short term projects are, effect, are impacting on the availability of tradespeople to undertake this work. But that's a key message there um, that's come out of the work from, from KPMG that hopefully will resonate uh, with everybody. And then there's kind of a little bit around what are the risks and, and blockers. I mean, the first risk is what happens if we don't grow 75,000 um, people over the next 20 years. Um, the work will still happen, as I mentioned, um, and, and therefore um, that the workforce will come from across the sea, uh, across the UK and overseas. Um, so what are, in summary, you know, the, the risks um, to, to delivering what is absolutely key infrastructure is, is a lack of provision in the region. Back to the comment about going uh, scaling from 100 to 1,000 a year. Um, maybe a lack of joined up approach. Is there a skills strategy to, to, to deliver? Now, there's an interesting point. Um, obviously, um, what, you know, if, 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 that, if I had an ask, it would be that, for example, the local skills um, improvement plan uh, which effectively will become the strategy for Greater Lincolnshire, um, has this as a key element of it. Now, now, I'm working within that group, so hopefully I can make that point. But it's absolutely critical that we all work together because colleges, universities, private training providers, none of us can do this in isolation. We all need to work together. So lack of provision, lack of a joined up approach, and actually a lack of tutors. Um, you know, the, the, the pay differential between somebody working in industry on the tools and what I can pay them as a, a training provider is huge. So we have to understand how we can we can get the tutors with industry experience to deliver uh, what's needed. So those are my kind of takeaways from it. There's lots of words there, but, but those are my kind of key, key takeaway. This isn't about a lack of funding, interestingly. And, and somebody might want to push back to me in the questioning. But for me, it's, it's about how we focus the funding, not about a lack of funding. But that's just a, that's just a thought. 
I hope I'm doing okay for time. Uh, um, so I mentioned about the client contractor relationship and this diagram I hope uh, tries to, to explain that. So the top of the triangle above the line is, is the client companies. And these are the ones that we all see. These are the ones I've talked about. These are the, the refineries, um, the, the um, British Steel, uh, um, the uh, Salt End Chemical Park, all the companies, Centrica Storage. These are the big client companies. Um, and they have a number of staff roles, employed people, uh, and they are the ones that are own the site and they're going to operate it, but they don't build the infrastructure. And actually, often they don't maintain it either. They're relying on the people below the line, who are the contractors. And, and these are the people we need to be talking to, to understand what their needs are. We all focus on the top. We're all we're, we all do it, whether you're um, a local authority, a lab or a, or a training provider, we all talk to the people at the top because they are the ones that are going to operate the site and they're the ones who own the site. But actually it's the, the tier one, the bigger contractors, the Whirlies, the brands, the people, the, the, the organizations like that who, who, um, who really uh, kind of own the people. And also below the tier one. So the tier ones are the big people who will be the engineering procurement um, and, and the front end engineering design for these big infrastructure projects. They'll be bringing it all together, but even they rely on lower tier contractors to deliver and right at the bottom where the actual biggest chunk of people are is actually self-employed contractors and there's lots of recruitment agencies that kind of make doing that introduction piece between the contractors and the uh, and the tier one tier two and, and, and below so those are the people that we really need to influence and understand and they're the ones that, have, that struggle they really struggle because they are the ones that are losing people to these short-term projects or even bigger long-term projects like nuclear um, and, and they're the ones that we need to, to, to really support. So hopefully that kind of makes a bit of sense there on that slide, but it's how we're trying to present the, the complexity of, of the problem that we're trying to deal with. And you, you kind of get poaching between contractors and who's going to pay the higher price. And, and, and maybe some of the clients are, um, some of the bigger clients have got more influence than others. Um, but we are starting to see for these infrastructure projects, some of that kind of tier one work now starting to, to appear. So it is really happening. Um, and uh, for example, um, I'm sure many of you will have heard of Humber Zero, which is the program to deliver um, a, ne a net zero position for the two refineries. And um, Humber Zero have recently held a supply chain um, event where they're starting to talk to and sign up the lower tier supply chain companies to make sure they've got sufficient companies on board. But have these companies all got the right number of people um, to deliver what's needed? Uh, there's a whole conversation needed around that. Okay, so that's a real quick whistle stop tour through where we are in terms of skills. I thought it was also be worthwhile just bringing in a few other aspects from the, from the, from the plan that kind of touch on this as well, that touch on the skills element. And one of those is, what do, what do the people in our region think about industrial decarbonisation? And I suppose I come back to my point about green skills. What are green skills? You see, I, I talk more about skills for green industries rather than green skills, because for me, green skills are, and, and you know, I'm sure you will have talks um, throughout the week around um, you know, the need for um, solar PV so for, um, for EV charging. Um, and that is absolutely critical on that journey. But I'm talking specifically here about industrial decarbonisation. So for us, it was really important that we understood what, in, what society out there thinks about the work that we're doing and about our industries. And, uh, you know, we see it day in, day out, as I mentioned earlier. Um, about the challenges that our industries um, face at the moment. So we, we actually have done a lot of stakeholder kind of um, activity around the societal impact of the work. Um, I'm not going to talk through this slide, but really all I wanted to do was, was show this, what has been an, an important piece of work to understand what the population think about, about our industries. And this, this, this particular slide was the result of a workshop um, that we undertake and uh, uh, undertook um, a while back. Uh, and you can see how skills and employment uh, leveling up. You can see the key kind of themes that have come out of it. The Humber being an exemplar region, 
It's all the stuff I've talked about, really. This is great. I love this. Um, this is the roadmap to net zero, quite literally. It's a really nice informal piece of work that we commissioned as part of the Humber Industrial Cluster Plan. It's, it's a doodle. And it shows that actually the, the industrial journey for the Humber has been a long, long one that goes back many years. And you know, our first kind of touch points with Humber, with, with hydrogen, for example, were at Salt End in the early 1900s. So hydrogen, which is, which is the, the clean energy of the future, is nothing new and certainly nothing new to this region. And that's a key point that I want to kind of pull out from this diagram. This is downloadable. Um, you can get this from the Humber Industrial Cluster Plan website. Uh, and I love this. It's a great informal way to show people the journey we've been on. And of course, that cloud at the bottom right is, is, is where we are now in that kind of decarbonisation journey, turning the tide in favour of clean green growth. Uh, leading to net zero 2040 with the gold cup there. I think that's a great, uh, great picture um, for, for our region and shows that journey that we've been on. This is slightly more formal, but still um, a nice, easy uh, diagram to, to kind of to, to use, I suppose, in terms of showing the totality of the opportunities in our region. That's why I've left it in here. This again is downloadable on the website, uh, Humber Industrial Cluster Plan. And it is the 2030 vision for a low carbon cluster. You won't be able to read all the words, I'm sure, because I can't from here. Um, but what this map shows is the pipeline that's planned to go across the region from Drax across to Easington uh, gas terminal. Um, it also shows the projects that I'm sure many of you heard of, have heard about. Humber Zero, I mentioned just now, Zero Carbon Humber, which is the pipeline linked to some um, hydrogen fuel switching and, and other decarbonisation projects. Um, it shows um, VNet Zero, which is a project to repurpose a pipeline down to Theddlethorpe and out into um, um, an old oil and gas um, storage um, area off the South uh, North Sea. And it also shows the dotted line out to um, um, the fields, the, the saline aquifer fields um, that, that are actually going to be shared. You can see the dotted line going off into the northeast, uh, which is part of the East Coast cluster, which is a joined up project with uh, with Teesside. And then all of the kind of the boxes there show some of the emitters um, that are going to be plugging into that pipeline or those pipelines. Um, and that's how we are effectively going to um get to that net zero position in one nice simple map to understand it also shows the offshore wind which is absolutely critical to this piece of work as well um, uh, and there is a project called gigastack which is about electrolyzing using green energy um, to produce what they call blue um sorry green hydrogen uh, which is ele um, using electrolysis so the plan would be to use the the green energy produced by orsted or um, offshore wind to, re, to, to, to support the net zero position for the refineries by producing clean um, green hydrogen. So lots of really exciting projects and the totality of that is 15 billion pounds worth of investment into our region. And really just to round off, um, I just wanted to highlight something we've done recently. Um, so the Humber Energy Board, um, is the strategic leadership group, it's public private sector board um, that drives the, the, the energy um, strategy for the region. And this is great because this is something, this vision is something that, that was a real tangible deliverable from that group. Often I sit on loads of these boards uh, and often, I'll be honest, they're often talking shops. This board has actually produced something in, in, in a matter of weeks. It, it, it came as an idea in one of our groups that we actually, have we got a real vision for the Humber? We should have because of all the reasons I've said. Um, and, and, you know, now we have. Um, we've produced this document uh, and it was a, a collaboration between the organisations you can see there. The Humber Industrial Cluster Plan obviously being our catch touch point in that. Um, and, and we help support the delivery of that Humber vision. So we now have one, um, which is absolutely fantastic. And that was um, launched, showcased in Westminster uh, last week.
Those are the organizations supporting it. They're the obvious organizations you'd expect. And it's a great example of public private sector working together and academia. And there's loads of different within the document. It's worth getting a hands on a document. I think it's downloadable. Um, but it shows on the left hand side of this slide here the huge amount of projects that we've got ongoing for that kind of 15 billion pounds worth of investment over the next 20 years or so. Another example of the map. And some facts and figures, you know, and they really are startling. Um, I've mentioned the 15 billion pound figure a few times now. Um, we are the largest industrial cluster. 30% um, of the UK's hydrogen can be produced in the Humber. It goes on and on. One in 10 regional jobs will be safeguarded and thousands of new jobs created by decarbonizing the Humber. And I'll probably leave it at that. Um, it's probably a nice place to leave it. As I say, hopefully that I think it's downloadable. This and that's it. Hopefully, I haven't uh, bored everyone to death, and uh, hopefully, you've got some feel for the passion that this region needs to get around industrial decarbonisation and the opportunities from it. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. And I, I'm sure I can speak for all of us. Your your passion really does come through. I think you're quite right. You know, the challenges are huge, but so are the opportunities. And, you know, to get to, to reach those, those massive numbers for, for jobs going forward, we really, really will have to find ways to, to inspire young people in our schools and colleges. You know, we need to get, get to them early um, so that we can, we can really ensure that every single young person in our region understands and knows what is happening, the exciting opportunities that that provides. And I suppose um, that would be a good, good place now to open it up um, to everyone um, on the webinar now to ask any questions or to talk about or ask uh, and, and share any of the challenges that they see in terms of getting this information and you know inspiring our young people in schools and colleges so has anyone got anything they'd like to share or anything they'd like to ask and, uh, and sorry just just to add to that i would i, I go back to my question from for, or challenge from earlier you know is this something that people young people are talking mm -hmm. about in schools mm -hmm. and are our industry something that they would consider or is it because of the maybe negative connotations about our industries that, that it's something that young people wouldn't consider. Uh, just please come off mute. I can see someone's got their hand off. Oh, it's Amy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's me. Um, yeah, I would just try it. Thank you ever so much, David. And um, I just wanted to ask I guess actually to yourself but also to anybody else um along those lines just, just thinking about the stereotypes um I just kind of wondering out loud do you think is there anything that we can do or what what one thing do you think would help or work to try and challenge that stereotype for young people that actually by you know you spoke about people not wanting to be part of that industry but actually is there anything that we could do that would help change that that by mm -hmm. that people see that by being part of it they can be part of the change I was, I was just going to say that Amy that that's exactly the point is how we spin it you know you're not part of the problem you're part of the solution that mm -hmm. to me is the really exciting thing all of my apprentices that are here all of those 130 are going to be part of the solution. They are going to be operating, they're going to be maintaining the carbon capture plants, the hydrogen plants. They, they, they're going to be part of the solution. So it's all about how we spin it, the positive mm -hmm. connotations that we put. And, and jobs in our industries, you know, the, in, the, the, the heavy energy intensive industries, they are still highly skilled jobs. You, you, know, you will get a fantastic career, a fantastic trade, transferable skills absolutely critical um, in a good industry that pays well. It's how you spin it. I think that's really important. We all need to be on board in terms of that message. Otherwise, we as a region are going to lose a, a massive opportunity for our young people. Definitely. And Paul? Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I agree. I, th I think a lot of it is about how we spin it. And I think 
the, the, the problem is it's about trying to, to get the kids engaged and enthused into the industry. I don't, you know, from, from my point of view, I don't really think it's always about having a negative connotation of it. Because actually, I think, you know, students know about these businesses and they, they see them as around. But it's about trying to create, create something with them, which starts really, which I think starts from a really young age. Um, to try and enthuse them and let them know what actually is out there and the sort of roles that are there and what they physically do because they don't understand what they do. And, you know, for me, and what we're trying to do, especially at Clean Thoughts, is trying to get it so that at the very bottom of year seven, they're having conversations about what businesses are available and what opportunities are and what so So they've got that sort of like pathway and they can sort of see where they're going. And I think sometimes organisations get caught up in the idea that they only want to come and talk to 10s and 11s or they only want to come and talk to uh, the kids who are doing it in engineering, for example, or perhaps even science. But actually, we have a lot of kids who would be switched off by those ideas. And, you know, we're talking about all the decarbonisation. You know, a lot of that comes into geography, does come into our science as well, but it comes into so many different aspects. And I think it's trying to hit students in lots of different ways, in lots of creative sort of ways, to try and enthuse them into it. Because I think, you know, more we can, more we can do in that sort of way, you know, even if it's sort of like just doing sort of like small little projects. So I, I think about you know, Orsa did a couple of weeks ago here where they came in and just built wind turbines with, you know, 50 kids in the sports hall. Brilliant event. You know, not all those kids had the idea that they wanted to do renewable energy and they wanted to do this, that and the other. But it's those little things, those takeaways, where they come in, do an activity or see something, which then hooks them onto it and think, actually, that's where I want to go and that's what I want to do. It is absolutely... Absolutely, Paul. I think we're, we're working with um, quite a number of your uh, board members, organisations and your industrial partners. We've got lots of those organisations acting as enterprise advisors, working with our schools and colleges. But we definitely, you know, going back to what you were saying, David, about having a, a more cohesive sort of joining up, putting together kind of approach, I think those are the sorts of things that would definitely help where we can where we've got ready to go projects to take to schools people that can come in and help with lessons um yeah and i, I know someone sarah's in the in the comment has put you know uh, helping recruit employees that you've mentioned and shown for careers fairs um and i know it's difficult a lot of organizations you know need need a lot of advance notice to be able to attend those but i'd, yeah. I'd certainly think looking at some sort of school outreach a, a, you know a cohesive offer would be really helpful i mean i can certainly take that point in the chat um away um we're always keen to to come to to fair, schools fairs whatever so very happy to to engage there if i can get some contact details that would be great but back to paul's point um i think there's two two answers i'd like to kind of make the two points i'd like to make there one is you mentioned year um Year seven. I, I want to go back earlier. Um, oh, we were better, better, I think. Yeah, with that. Oh, sorry, I missed that, Paul. Sorry. No, I, th I think the idea of going back even further than that is, is, is even better because you know it's like and we have links with with like our, our private schools and things like that. So you know if, if, what we are doing at the moment, we're just we we set up our timetable so we can have more more events going on sort of on Wednesday afternoon. We've got primary schools coming in. And we do a science road show. We did one last year where we invited in local primary schools. So they came in and did activities as well as what we did. So actually you get that integration all the way through. So I think, I think you're completely right on that. And, yeah. and I just, sorry, I'm, I know I'm, I'm waffling now, but um, just as an example, we had Northern Power in last year. They came and spoke to, they came in for a morning and they hit some year eights and year nines and year 10 lessons. And what they did in the geography lessons was they gave them a map and they got them just to plot out where they thought a substation should go where they should have um, the, the, the pylons and looking at different aspects. And actually that was a brilliant activity. And it was the same activity, but it was delivered to three different year groups, just in small groups of 30 kids. Yeah. And, you know, it was something they got out of it, the, you know, Northern Power got a lot of it. They, re they really enjoyed coming. And it's those little things. They probably got some good intelligence. <laughs> oh, definitely. And the thing is, though, it's just, it, it's something which, you know, wasn't an, it wasn't a massive activity wasn't over the top, wasn't wasn't too taxing, but allowed them to understand actually what is Northern Power, what do they do, and you know, how do they make decisions? And it, it, it was a brilliant little little exercise mm -hmm. really, just as an isolated event. 
Yeah. So, yeah. so I'm with you 100. percent I think you know. Let's reach back into into primary. We work with children challenging industry. It's an organisation that's based at York Uni. Um, they come and talk to to primary kids and get them interested in wider STEM, but actually interestingly based around the chemical sector, which is which is that kind of subliminal thing. Uh, and then the other point you made, I think, is really key as well, is about how many people know what a process operator is. I mean, I've had people telling me, oh, well, that's someone who kind of puts uh, guts fish on a on a on a line. Well, actually, a chemical process operator is a highly skilled role uh, with a fantastic career opportunity, and these are the people that run the plants. As a young 18 year old, you're going to be running a process manufacturing, a chemical process manufacturing plant, making a product. Not many people know that. They don't know about these jobs that are available. Highly skilled, highly yeah. paid jobs. So it's a great point about let's let's actually de industry industry. <laughs> let's let's demystify it. Yeah. So it's about how it's yeah. kind of spun. Thank you. Hayley. <laughs> Hi, my name's Hayley Gillam. Um, I'm an operational manager within Young People Support Services. So um, my team, I have a team of careers advisors and a team of neat practitioners who work with unemployed young people post 16. And, and some of, I've, I've really enjoyed today. I've, I've found it really useful. And um, some of the comments have already been made really in terms of what I wanted to raise. But for me, it is that whole um, level of, of understanding, getting the messages out there too. And I totally agree about going right back to primary school. I think there's things that are absolutely changing at, at, at pace and it's, it's hard for us professionals to keep up to date with mm. everything. So it's how we get those messages across to our young people that we want to, you know, that is our future. Um, it's about getting it across in an understandable way for them as well, mm. pitching at the right level, whether that's a primary mm. or secondary and understanding different the way that people learn. Um, but it's it's that it's that knowledge, exactly what, what probably Paul's just said in terms of understanding what the differences are between, you know, going and working at my energy that's around, you know, sort of, um, you know, the, the electric charges and etc. And then working in, you know, sort of this, this in, it's understanding the different industries, what they're about and, and exactly that, what is a chemical process operator? Mm. What, what does yeah. this mean for our area? How are we going to get that message across? And then this is what you need to do to be able to, you know, get into something like this. I, I feel that feel that's that that's not quite there and I think if it was I think it would help educate our young people and I know that some of our young people that come into the Maltz and Sense where we're based I know if I ask them what is what is meant you know by the by this that a lot of them wouldn't wouldn't have a, a, a clue yeah. sadly mm. um, and I just think if, if we get that right that we've just talked about how we educate our young people of our future in our area it will make because i think people still think that, that there's not that many opportunities in our area mm -hmm. and yeah. they have to yeah. go away to university and never come back mm -hmm. and, and that's mm -hmm. not true um Definitely it's not. about how we get that message out i think is, is something that i'm quite passionate about and i know some of my team are as well that are also on on this call mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and that what I think, uh, what, what, what I think, interesting as well is how do you reach really hard to reach communities as well? Like, um, uh, dare I pick on? I'll probably upset someone, but let's say the East Marsh area of, of, of Grimsby. How do you get into there? Is it always through the schools, or um, dare I say, or is it potentially through other maybe more innovative routes? I mean, I was at a meeting the other day at Grimsby Town Football Club, and I was sat next to a pastor from East Marsh, and it's like chatting to him is both of us had a eureka moment that we need to talk to each other you know a yeah. completely different route into these young people uh, and then maybe that will filter into schools and, and that's how we can get that message out there's lots of ways we can be clever about this but but yeah i mean the jobs are there there are jobs there's so there plenty of opportunity out there yeah it's exactly what you said as well get into that harder to reach co-op because they're typically the young people who maybe don't um have you know sort of a, a background of secure you know sort yep. of education and you Absolutely. know well, that doesn't mean that they're not completely academically able they're just you know the education system for whatever reason just haven't, haven't had the opportunities worked. all you need is five gcses to get onto one of my course now that could even that could be unassailable to some people you know dare i say yeah um but you know for five gcses you know mm. we're not and, and you can end up with a highly skilled trade at the end of it it's, it's, yeah. it's such a great opportunity and we need to get it that message out. 
we do and i think it's it's we've got to get that message out to our young people we've also got to upskill our teachers so you know maybe looking at visits to some of these incredible projects and places and businesses for teachers um will will really help so that they can go back and talk with passion about what the opportunities that they've seen but but also looking at how do we get that message out to to parents because they're mm. such huge influencers mm. yeah, absolutely. um so, yeah. We often rely on parents who are in our industry, basically mm -hmm. telling their children to come along to our events. Mm. That's wrong. Yeah. We need to reach out to a wider community. Yeah, definitely. I could go on all um, day, I'm afraid. Sorry. Uh, we could. And, 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 and the comments are, you know, oh, my God, I've got to leave. But that was absolutely fantastic. Good. So um, I really am so grateful, David, for you, to, you know, coming along this afternoon and, and sharing this information with us all. It is exciting and the opportunities are you know they're astounding so uh, we uh, will certainly be doing all we can to get young people uh, aware and inspired by these opportunities um and uh, uh you know after this uh, webinar i'll make sure that the slides go out to everybody not not just the attendees but we'll get them out to everybody all Brilliant. the schools and colleges and the um the recording and i'll put the links to those websites uh that you mentioned in your presentation as well okay. and, and um, my contact details I, you know yeah. i've just had a look at the comments there and yeah there's a few you know i can basically i'd, I'd like to touch base with so if, if people want to contact me that'd be great lovely i will definitely do that so thank you ever, ever everyone that, uh, that attended um i'm really glad that you found it uh, so interesting and useful and um, we shall be all working together to make sure that we take this and, and make it happen so thank you ever so much bye bye thank you